Okay, so um, thank you for inviting me. I was actually looking forward to going to, I think you invited me a while ago and I was kind of looking forward to going to um, Ottawa because I've never been there before, but, but here we are. Um, uh, <laughs> it's not the first talk I've missed. Um, uh, let, me, let me just say before I get on to my talk that everything like this presents an opportunity and um, I've kind of re re um, invigorated a collaboration with a former student of mine and we have a pretty nice model for the um, immune and inflammatory response of COVID and, and how it, it interacts with the innate immune system and we can fit monkey data pretty well with it. And we kind of have an idea of what time you should put in anti-inflammatories and stuff like that. It's kind of fun. So, you know, the nice thing about doing math is you can, you're not really stuck in doing one subject. Um, anyway, I will um, start the talk. This is Follow Your Nose, the Mathematics of Olfactory Navigation. Um, now if I can get, there we go. Okay. So um, detection of chemical gradients is essential for obtaining nutrients and avoiding threats. Um, but what makes it kind of hard is that, that the olfactory scenes are very complex. Turbulent fluid dynamics are common in macroscopic environments and, and yet animals have really robust methods for extracting directional cues from this um, highly variable olfactory signal. And what I'm interested in is what behavioral processes allow for successful odor navigation, what algorithms could be used. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this started about four years ago um, in a, something called an NSF ideas lab. Um, it's sort of like um, a survivor for scientists. They brought a bunch of us in we weren't allowed to go anywhere. We had five days to break up into groups. We made presentations and three of those groups were um, funded. And, and I'm happy to say that the, the first three years of funding, um, we've rejoined with some of the other groups and we've gotten a big five-year grant to continue this work. Um, but the idea was to combine experimental fluid dynamics with um, John Cromaldi, who's at Boulder, He's a fluid dynamics guy. Behavior, Lucia Jacobs is at Berkeley. Um, Nathan Urban is, was at Pitt, now he's a provost at Lehigh. And Kathy Nagel, who is um, <clears throat> a neuroscientist at, at NYU. Physiology, that is Nathan and Eustace Verhagen at Yale and Kathy. And modeling and analysis, so that's me and Jonathan Victor at Cornell. And I'm going to talk about some of the modeling approaches and their math analysis. Okay, so the first thing you're going to see is a video here and you can look in the upper part of the corner, you can see the hand of God coming down and dropping a mouse. Okay, and there's two trails here. One is a sham trail and the other is one that the mouse has been trained on. And you can see the mouse is doing a pretty good job. So the right odor is the one associated with the reward and the left one is not, and they go on trail following behavior, as you can see. <clears throat> and they tend to hang out on this one trail, much more. And I will stop that here. And so this sort of shows you, um, the blue is um, a path of the, the mouse's movement, and you can see that it spends most of its time on this trail. Um, can everybody see my pointer? Yes? No? Yes, yes. I can yes. see yes. it. Yes. I can yes. see it. Good, good, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so, so this is looking at a trail. In other experiments, um, the mouse has got to find a single spot of odor. Um, in, uh, I should say that these are, um, what, is, what happens is um, um, Nathan and his um, students and postdocs, they take um, a wax, um, a paraffin crayon and embed it with oil of wintergreen. And then um, they draw onto the table. This is a, a table that's lit from below um, with um, 
red, an infrared light and it's done in the dark. So the mouse has no visual um, signals at all. And so the mouse just has to try and find the, the, the trail solely by its sense of smell. It's been, it's been um, trained to associate the smell of wintergreen with, um, <clears throat> with a food reward. And so it will follow the trail. Um, we've subsequently stopped baiting trails now and we have another um, technique where we, automatic, we automate checking where the mouse is. And if he gets within a certain distance of the odor, then a light goes on and he runs back into a corner and he gets his food reward. Okay. So here's an example of spot finding. Okay, the spot is right here and there's the mouse. And that was probably Annie Lou that dropped the mouse down because we had two different people doing mice and one is a very gentle and one just tossed the mouse on there. So there is an example of spot finding by the mouse. Trying to figure out how to, there we go. So what does an odor landscape look like, all right? So in, in John Cromaldi's lab, they use something called planar, P-L-I-F, um, planar laser interferometry. And basically what happens is um, they blow acetone mixed with helium to make it neutrally buoyant, buoyant through a tube and then a camera, <clears throat> acetone fluoresces under blue, uh, ultraviolet light. And then a camera can um, record what this plume looks like. And they, they, um, they get pretty, very high spatial resolution and very high um, temporal resolution, 15 frames per second of what these plumes, and these are single shots. So this is what happens at 10 centimeters per second when the odor is close to the ground, and you can see it's very diffuse. Um, and whereas in this case, um, the odor is going faster and it's not close to the ground and it's much more columnar. And you'll see in some of the videos that it has, um, <clears throat> it's much more turbulent looking. Um, these these um, experiments were done by, by John's grad student, um, Aaron Connor. Um, is there a, question from the chat? I see that. Or is that? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. That was just a yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So one question, that one of the first questions we wanted to ask is what kind of information um, content is in plumes? And this is done with Sebastian Bois and um, Jonathan Victor. Um, Jonathan's an expert in information theory. I'm not so much an expert on information theory, but I was somewhat involved. <clears throat> but basically <clears throat> what, what they did was they looked at the, um, the odor, I mean, what, what the concentration was sensed at different locations in space. There's some blue dots here and some green dots. This just shows the locations. And then they asked um, about how much information was contained if, for example, you broke the concentration into several, um, you know, one bit, three bits, or five bits, um, whether you used left and right, um, if you had two sensors, um, whether you compared things with earlier time and later time. And basically, you can see that the, the information as you break the um, odor up into more um, and here what I'm talking about is information about where the odor is located. So what, what we're trying to say is what would the, con what, you know, if we get concentration at a, a certain concentration, what does that say about the origin, where the odor is located? So this is the sort of question that this was asking. And in fact, you can see the more you break the concentration up, the more um, information you get in terms of, this is mutual information. Okay, so what kinds of algorithms could an animal use to, um, to seek out odors? For a smooth environment, the easiest goal is to just move up a gradient. This is essentially what bacteria do. Um, so how can an animal do this um, when they do chemotaxis? Well, there's several different kinds of um, algorithms. I'm going to talk about two of them today. 
they're completely local. They don't depend on any memory and they don't depend on any kind of global um, mapping of the environment. Um, there are other algorithms that are more complicated, such as infotaxes and entropotaxes that depend on making a map and you have to have a prior what you think the plume looks like and you need wind direction and things like that, but you can make a global map. And these are very good when you have very sparse um, odor information. But here we're talking about animals that are low to the ground, for example, a mouse or a, a walking fruit fly, where the, the odor is a little bit more diffuse and um, you get more hits of the odor than you would say out in a big field. So there's spatial algorithms where you sample at two locations and move towards the higher, say a difference between two sensors, such as antennae or nares. Okay, nares are the two not nostrils, okay? And then there's spatio-temporal um, algorithms where you sample at different locations at different times. And then again, you move towards the higher um, location. As I said, there can be a more complex algorithms like spatial, building a spatial map, and one of these is called infotaxis. Um, these first two, these are really easy to implement, both as an algorithm and neurally based. And I'm not going to do any of the neural basis of this, but that's sort of the subject of some of the more recent stuff we're going to start working on, or have been working on, is to figure out what circuitry in animals is used um, to detect these odor gradients. <coughs> And information theory, the stuff that I just showed earlier, suggests that looking at two different times close by or looking at two different spatial locations could be very useful in um, determining where the odor was. Okay, so let me start with the planar binaural, oh, too many letters there, the planar binaural algorithm. This is the simplest algorithm you can imagine. <clears throat> I'm going to assume the agent, in this case I've drawn it as a mouse, moves at a constant speed and it goes in a direction if it's heading theta and the heading changes as a function of the difference in the two sensor locations. Okay, So it's very simple. If left concentration is bigger than right concentration, then theta increases, which means you go clock counterclockwise and if right is bigger you go clockwise and that's very simple algorithm and the x and y positions are in the plane v is the constant velocity and xlr and ylr are the positions of the sensor and therefore the xl is just the current position plus the length of the um the length of the sensor times cosine of the angle plus the angle between the sensor, that's phi, okay? So it's a very simple algorithm. <clears throat> and it works great on smooth Gaussian landscapes, all right? So here it is finding a spot. Um, <clears throat> basically, I'm starting at different locations and starting with the same initial orientation. Um, here, I'll draw on here. Theta is, theta of zero is one. Oh, what happened to my, oh, there we go. So the theta is roughly heading in this direction. That's basically the initial algorithm, initial orientation for this particular case. Um, <clears throat> and you can see in many cases, it finds the spot. Other cases, it completely misses it. Um, and on a trail, in, in particular, this is a very interesting case in the trail, when you start exactly orthogonal to the trail, because it's a completely deterministic algorithm, um, and you're looking at left and right, and when, when you've got left and right and you're facing forward, they have exactly the same um, concentration, so it goes right through this. It's not an asymptotically stable attracting system, because if I move just a little bit, you can see that I follow the, um, I follow the trail. I want to go backwards. Why, why doesn't it? 
Oh, there, there. Now the arrow keys are letting me. Okay. <clears throat> so now we can ask, for example, um, let's consider um, a, a trail. Okay. Just a trail. If you look at a trail, the concentration is independent of y because it's a vertical trail. And so we're left with the x and theta system. So it's a planar dynamical system. And so we can basically look at what happens in there. So the, in, in a planar dynamical system, there's two fixed points. One is at theta equals pi over two, which corresponds to going up the trail. And the other is theta equals three pi over two, which corresponds to going theta down the trail. And here is an example of some trajectories in depending on the distance you are away, this, the trail is centered right here at the origin, okay? Um, X equals zero is the trail. And you can see that everything that starts inside these blue um, regions as the basin of attraction will uh, be attracted to the trail. Now, what's interesting is it, it, anybody who's a dynamical systems person usually associates basins of attraction with um, saddle points, but there's no saddle points at all in this system. So the question is what's going on? And it turns out that um, if you make an approximation, say the sensors are very short, um, the sensor length is very short, then you can do a kind of Taylor series expansion and you end up with a second order, a, a same sort of two dimensional system, but it's integrable. So you can write an integral for this. And this E is um, constant along trajectories. <clears throat> and if you set E equals zero, then you get a very nice approximation. That's the red curves here of the basin of attraction. <clears throat> so essentially um, what's going on is even though there's no saddle points, there's this energy function that as X goes to infinity, it pinches down to this sort of distorted wedge-like, or this little, um, I guess it looks like rolling stone lips. Okay. Um, now, how does this, here I've shown the algorithm on a simple straight trail. It also works pretty well on more realistic shape trails. Here's an example where it's followed a curved trail. And you can see it comes around here. And then um, I guess it comes around this way and then it gets onto the trail and it makes these nice little oscillations as it settles in. And those oscillations are reflected by this um, oscillation here. And you can see it there because this attractor here is a, um, is a spiral sort of sink. Okay, now what about spot finding? Radially symmetric, landscapes make it easy as well because then we can convert to polar coordinates x equals r cosine should have used not phi because i used that for the sensor angle but r for now we'll use it as a polar r cosine phi and y equals r sine phi and psi is the relative difference between your heading and your polar position and in this case you get a two-dimensional dynamical system again um, in R, the radius from the spot, and psi, your relative angle. And there's two fixed points of this that correspond to periodic orbits around the spot. For a single spot, neither of these are stable, but there's a localized region near the spot that's attracting. And as far as the, quote, mouse is concerned, all it has to do is get close. So let me show you. Here is the geometry of it. There's a relative angle here, and there's the distance. The spot is actually at zero, and there's two fixed points that correspond to unstable limit cycles and stable limit cycles, where you just follow things around, okay? Um, oh, this is, this is not a spot anymore. <laughs> I apologize. This is now a circular trail because with a spot, there's no stable um, fixed points at all. This is a circular trail. Oh, never mind. I don't know why. Ah, 
I apologize again. This S doesn't mean stable, it's a saddle limit cycle. All right, now, okay, so this is a spot. And this is an unstable limit cycle. This is a saddle limit cycle, all right? And what's interesting is the stable manifolds of this break the domain into essentially regions which get arbitrarily close to the spot, which you can see by following this trajectory, and positions that go away from the spot. So in some sense, even though the spot is itself not attracting, if you start inside this region here, you'll end up close to the spot. The, region, the, the reason the spot's not attracting is because the mouse has to always move. If you set the velocity to zero, then of course it will get stuck at the spot. So for the spot, the task is just to locate the spot. And for trail following, it must be located and followed. So when far away, a search strategy is needed. And as with the spot and with an infinite line, circular trails with a radius R naught leads to a planar dynamical system, okay? And in that case, we get the same equations, um, but the concentrations are a little bit different because we have a circular trail <clears throat> and concentrations again, but what's really cool about this is even though it's a very simple dynamical system, it has very cool dynamics. So here's an example as we change R naught, the radius. So let me, um, again, annotate here. This is a circular trail and R naught is the diameter of this, or the radius of the trail. And phi naught, remember we have sensors. There's our two sensors. And phi, in this case, is the angle between the sensors. So you'll notice that pi over two, sensors at pi over two are on your side, okay? Okay, so now what you see in this particular case is as the sensor for a, um, as a sensor angle, um, this is in the R, yeah, as this is the bifurcation diagram, R, um, the radius of the fixed point as a function of the sensor angle. And this means it's as, for sensor angles up to some minimum, okay, the animal follows the trail very nicely, okay, and then there's a hop bifurcation right here, which gives rise to a unstable torus. Blue means an unstable periodic orbit. And in xy theta space, this is a torus, but in relative space, it's a fixed point, okay? As we change R naught, we get more interesting behavior. For example, when R naught equals 0.55, okay? This hop bifurcation becomes supercritical, okay? And then it dies right here on the capital H, that's a homoclinic. And there's an unstable periodic orbit that comes from way out here that meets right there. And then as we continue to shrink this circle, all right, these two homoclinic orbits come together and you get what's called an isola, where you get a merging of these two periodic orbits, okay? And there's a saddle node of limit cycles here, here. And finally, as R naught gets even smaller, you have a stable fixed point where you follow the trail, and then this stable periodic orbit where it's kind of a torus. And I'll show you some examples. This is a two parameter picture, sensor angle versus R naught, all right? And this dashed line here is the line at which, below which you lose the homoclinics, okay? On the other hand, if you have long sensors as a function of sensor length, you get this really complicated set of bifurcation diagrams. I don't want to spend too much time on them because they're pretty complicated, but let me say that beta is the sensitivity to odor, 
and L is the sensor length, all right? And there are, this is a two parameter diagram and there are lots and lots of curves that delineate things. Here is a fold of period, a fold of fixed points. That's what this red curve is. This is a Hopf bifurcation curve. This is a curve of homoclinics, the green. And this is saddle nodes of um, limit cycles. And what you see here is depending on where you are, for example, if you're in region A, you have exactly one fixed point, which means you follow the trail. The mouse gets on the trail and it just follows it, okay? In region B, you get two new fixed points, okay? This is a saddle node. You get two new fixed points, both of which are stable. One, you follow it outside, and then there's one that's a small amplitude that's from the inside. As we continue to change, say, sensor length in inner region C, this fixed point loses stability and becomes a stable periodic orbit. So you get bistability between following the trail like this and following the trail as a, this is a, this is a large amplitude following outside the trail. This is inside the trail. If, if you look at XY space, you get this weird torus. Finally, that merges and becomes unstable, and you're left again with a large amplitude stable periodic torus, and that's all that's left. So that's what happens out here in region E, okay? So the behavior is really complicated, even for a very simple dynamical system. So I'm showing you a video here. Here's a little cartoon of, see if I can play that again. This is the mouse in XY space. Um, you can see how big the sensors are relative to the radius. And this sort of shows um, the final version of the torus. And this is the stable following the trail. And this is the unstable following the, um, the, the torus. Human sub, so now I want to ask the question, what kind of techniques um, do people use for searching? Oh, incidentally, since I can't really see the chat, if you have any questions, just, just unmute yourself and ask. Any phase locking on those torus? Um, what do you mean phase locking? So oh. st stable periodic solutions on the torus. Oh, oh no, 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 because this is, okay, this, this torus is an artifact in, in um, no, because there's basically, um, if there is phase locking, it's a long, um, it, it, it's non-generic, okay? In other okay, words- a long period. It, 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 it could happen, but it would be purely coincidental. And if I change, for example, the velocity by just a tiny bit, then it will be lost. There's no robust locking. Okay. Obviously, enough. you can have rational relationships. Yeah, but, but, it, but it's not a stable, not a pe stable periodic solution. It's not a stable periodic solution. Okay. It's a neutral. Yes, exactly. Right, thank yes. you. The torus itself is attracting. Okay, so this was this is some interesting stuff that Lucia Jacobs did. Basically, what she did was she took one of John Cromaldi's older landscapes and she put people in a room, and that landscape, that odor was given a particular source, and the people wore headphones. And as they get close to this virtual landscape, sound would change depending on left or right, depending on the concentration in the virtual landscape. And so these are some of the strategies that people use. Um, I don't show one here, but there's a really cool one where people actually spiral outward, okay? And some people just kind of do random search like this guy down here. Other ones do fairly, um, fairly regular searching back and forth like that. Others kind of spiral in. Um, 
these two guys are completely random and this this guy's pretty random too so it leads to a question do you have a question or is this was there a chat question oh that was sorry <laughs> that was a phase locking one <laughs> oh shoot i i'm trying to get rid of the chat box and i hit escape sorry Full speed, full speed, there we go. Okay, sorry. Okay, so here is a typical mouse trajectory where the mouse starts and you can see he wiggles around for a while and then he ends, okay? And so what we were asked is what kinds of aspects do noise do? Can noise help or hinder, all right? And far enough away from the spot, essentially, psi equals zero and um, pi are attracting. So the agent just goes off to infinity, all right? And the basin is similarly small for a trail. So one search strategy, and I put search in um, quotes, is a correlated random walk. Um, that is, just put some noise in the heading, okay? So now, um, dx equals v cosine theta dt, dy is v sine theta dt, and d theta is beta um, c left minus concentration right plus some white noise, okay? So this, you can imagine that this could help. So here's an example of a couple of um, sample paths, okay, where in red, I show what happens deterministically. So in red, this guy would just go off to infinity. This is, this is on a trail, okay? He just goes off to infinity. Here's another example where he just goes off to infinity because in both cases, you're outside the basin of attraction. But if I add noise, you know, it still follows the vector field, but the noise can sometimes take you into the basin, and then at that point, you follow the trail. So here's a couple of sample paths where the agent gets onto the trail, even though without noise, it would just go straight through because of symmetry. So in this particular case, noise helped, okay? Here's an example with a point source. Remember I told you that these stable manifolds act as sort of a basin. And now if I start down here, Okay, then in the deterministic system, I go off to infinity, start even close to the base, and here in the deterministic system, I go off to infinity. This is showing a couple of those trajectories without noise. But now what happens with noise is I get kicked into the basin, and then I, I haven't shown the full sample path here, but I get arbitrarily close to the spot, as you can see here. Okay, so now let's suppose I start, let's see, I st in this particular case, let's see, I started at R naught equals 7.5 and psi equals two. Okay, so that is right here. Okay, I'm starting right about here at this location. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just run simulations, thousands of simulations and I'll stop the simulation when you get within one centimeter of the spot, or when you go out 10 centimeters, okay? So that's it, that's the only, those are the criteria for success. And what you see is fraction of success is a function of noise level, note the noise is in logarithmic scale, okay? And here's the fraction of success. And you can see that of course with no noise, or very little noise, there's no success because you're outside the basin and you'll never get in there. And then as the noise goes up, you get more and more success. And then it goes, it goes down. And then it drops off dramatically at higher noise levels. Similarly, the time to reach the spot starts out with a little bit of noise, it goes down. Remember, this is logarithmic, okay? It goes down and then it um, goes way up. And of course, at this point, it's, it's close to infinity because I think I stopped the, 
I stopped this. I only let it go for a little while. I think I let it go for a thousand time steps or, oh, let's see. I let it go for 250 time steps <laughs> or 250T. Okay. Now this is a little disingenuous because I'm saying noise helps, but that's because I'm outside the basin of attraction. And you could argue that if I was inside the basin of attraction, sometimes noise would kick me out, so it might harm. So if I start outside the basin, then clearly any amount of noise is better since it will always improve my chances to get into the basin since I had zero chance to get in if I was outside. But if I'm in the basin, then noise can make it worse. So I need a fair way to assess the role of noise and other ways to strategically use it. So ideally, what I would do is take a fixed area and take the average success rate over the whole area, okay? So what I would do is sprinkle points uniformly around here and then average the success. Now, unfortunately, that's ridiculously hard because just to get this curve, I had to do thousands of simulations to even get it this smooth. So what do we do? Well, for a point source, it's a planar system, and we consider the following thing. If R hits R min, then we'll count it as a success, and if it hits R max, then we'll call it a failure. So you can then write down an equation for the probability of success, all right? By writing the Fock, the um, backwards um, the backwards Fokker Planck equation, or the backwards equation for um, the, the backwards diffusion equation, okay, and you end up getting this um, second order PDE in psi and R, and I've added a little bit of noise to R to regularize it because the numerical solvers like that, okay, so there is our PDE, and we have boundary conditions that Q is, um, Q of R min, Q is the probability, so uh, Q of R psi is the probability of success as a function of starting at R and psi, okay? So that's the probability of success, where success means leaving R min, okay? Failure means leaving R max, and it turns out that, um, the one advantage of being in, a, one of the great advantages of being in the math department is that there's all kinds of people with all kinds of expertise in mathematics. In the sixth floor, I'm on the fifth floor, is numerical analysts, and they love finite elements. And it turns out that there's a really nice free finite element package called Phoenix that is um, runs under Python, which I didn't know, but you know, it takes a few minutes to learn and you can numerically solve this. And so basically what I show here is probability maps as a function of noise level, depending on where you start, okay? So you can see, if you remember what this looked like, there's that, remember this stable manifold, okay? That delineates the region from zero to pi um, into, attracting and non-attracting, and you can see that reflected in this. You can almost see um, this, this curve here, which is the basin. So everything that's in here is pretty solidly yes, and everything that's out here is pretty solidly no. And these, these base, the, the, you're working around the margins here. And so the question is, how much does this help? Does it help or hurt? Okay. Of course, with large noise, this is larger noise, um, the, the area of success gets much smaller and the area of failure gets bigger. On the other hand, there are regions where you have improved success. So what we then do is we can integrate the probability of success and find the average probability over this whole domain. And what you find is as a function of the diffusion coefficient, you get an improvement in success that then gradually decreases as the noise goes up. 
So it's kind of a form, you can think of it a little bit as a kind of stochastic resonance because the noise actually pushes you into the, um, to the basin and, and enough noise will push you into the basin and if it's not too much, it will then keep you, um, keep you in the basin. So this suggests maybe a strategy would be to have a lot of noise when, you're, when, when the concentration's low, but then when the concentration gets up, reduce your noise. We haven't really analyzed yet, yet but that's one of um, my PhD student, Noor, is going to be doing that. So you might ask, how does this simple algorithm perform in a real plume? All right, so I'm going to show you a simulation. And on the left is the fat plume, on the right is the thin plume, and you can see it does a good job of finding the plume. Oh, this spot here is an artifact, it was dirt in the camera. <laughs> but surprisingly, um, the algorithm, because the velocity is big enough, basically ignores it and goes right for the source. And you can see in the narrow plume, you can see how much more turbulent this is, but it still does a really good job of finding the plume. Okay, so summary, it works in lots of different environments. It's easy to understand and analyze and could be implemented with early olfactory circuitry. Um, we've actually implemented in some robots and there's a couple of papers out on that. There's also evidence for stereo affection in mice and humans and a number of other animals. And with a mouse, the nares are only two millimeters apart, but there's good evidence that the way the airflow goes is it really does take left and right um, into account. So I wanna spend the last few minutes here talking about casting, all right? So casting is a strategy used by insects such as moths and flies and involves moving crosswise orthogonal to the air direction. In a more general sense, animals like dogs and mice sample rapidly at different spatial locations and make decisions on this basis. Since sniffing is a discrete time event, the dynamics are intrinsically a discrete dynamical system. So I'm going to skip because there's only a few minutes left. Um, well, I'll talk about, yeah. So there's a couple of algorithms. One is while the odors above detection threshold choose a sniff direction, sample the concentration, compare with previous concentration. If the new concentration is higher, then set a new travel direction that's a function of the difference between your current. While randomly searching, if the um, odors below detection, choose a random travel direction, and then update concentration dependent velocity maybe, and move in travel direction. So this leads to a very, to a, a, a stochastic map, all right? And basically um, where each iteration is a sniff or a sample, okay? And we can make the, the if, if we made the, comparison left and right a step function, then we'd always go directly in, um, in the direction of the current strongest thing. Otherwise, we can um, kind of anneal it with a kind of a smoother version that depends on the difference in the concentration. Okay, and here's some examples of what happens on a trail, okay? So this, these are examples of success. And this is an example of a failure. Yeah, I guess, ah, there, yeah, there's the failure. All right, and this sort of shows you the nose position. So this gives you an idea that this algorithm could work pretty well, okay? Um, we can do some trail statistics, and this is a probability of hanging out. So you can see that it spends most of its time on the trail. Okay, same thing with the spot. This is a stochastic map. Again, and in this case, it, here's a failure where it was just facing the wrong direction and never was able to get itself back. Here are examples of multiple examples of um, success. The red shows nose position and the black shows the body position. 
Okay, and this, the task, this simple stochastic map does pretty well in a plume. Boom. Okay, now it's hard to analyze the stochastic map. So I figured let's do a periodic casting, okay? So suppose we let the cast angle that we check, the sample angle be say phi max times cosine two pi n over m, where m is an integer and the map is therefore m periodic. And we can look at the mth iterate and that gives us a deterministic system. So for simplicity, let's take m equals two. So on each odd sniff, we test to the right and on each even, we sample from the left, okay? And this, I'll just show you that this works on plumes. The trails actually look a lot like mice trails. Oh, incidentally, here what we do is we bounce off the edges. And now you can see that we do fine and we find the uh, thing. So basically, un plus one equals f of un comma n, where f is m periodic. And what we do is we study two iterates of this. <laughs> where Vn plus one is F of F of Vn, where G of Vn is, um, V is the vector X, theta, and concentration. And we use phi max as a parameter, okay? Where phi max is the maximum angle of the sample. As phi max goes to zero, you can see that X, theta, and C goes to zero, pi over two, one is a stable fixed point. So what we wanna do is study the dynamics as phi max increases. And it's really cool. Um, as phi max increases, you have a stable fixed point. And then there's a Neumark Sacker bifurcation. And you get these sort of hop, you know, complicated tori. Then there's a period three orbit and a period nine orbit. And then finally you get all this crazy chaos, okay? As phi max increases. So I think that's all I have to say on this. Conclusions, even simple spatio-temporal algorithms can locate sources in complex environments. Mathematical analysis of these algorithms sets some bounds on what they can and cannot do. What other methods do mice and other animals use to find odors when encounter probability is low? Well, there's things like intermittency, where you look at timing between getting the odor. As you get closer, the timing shrinks. Infotaxis, which determines what direction to go based on information theory. Um, we're currently trying to mimic the trajectories of mice with spot finding and trail following by using statistics that we get from experiments. Um, and we're also doing optogenetics and other tools to dissect the neural mechanisms underlying the behavior. And there's many other questions, both math and biology, and that's what the, the goal of this next four, five year grant is, is to look at some of the circuitry and look at what other influences, social, um, wind, and other things influence this trail following, okay? So I wanna say this is the group from the um, Ideas Lab, um, the PIs are Lucia Jacobs. She's no longer doing, um, sticking with us. She went off. Um, this is Noor Riemann. She's doing, she did all the trail work. Um, and we have a paper that will be coming out in Siam Review. Um, this is John Cromaldi at Boulder, okay? This is Jonathan Victor at Cornell. Um, Kathy Nagel at NYU. Andy Liu did all the mouse experiments. Jim did a lot of the simulations of the casting. Um, and this is, he's a, he was a former postdoc and there's Eustace Fairhawk and he's at Yale. Um, let's see, I think this is Sebastian, okay? And he and Jonathan did the information theory stuff as well. So I think I'll stop here and thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, inspiring talk. Um, Thank you. Let's open the microphones. If you have a question, please uh, go ahead.
I uh, put a question in the chat so you can ignore it now. Okay. <laughs> do, the, do the algorithms work equally well in 3D? In 3D? Yeah, like insects. Um, uh, you know, uh, flying insects. Actually, we have a, you know, with 3D, you, you can't just do two sensors, right? And in, with 3D, actually 3D is a very interesting question because what insects like moths do is, um, I think I can, yeah, I can annotate this. Okay, so what happens in 3D is the odor, there's a wind, there's wind, okay? Okay, and what moths do in 3D and mosquitoes and other animals, so with, with moths, they're trying to find the lady moth, okay? And with mosquitoes, they're trying to find this, the source of carbon dioxide. And what insects tend to do is in 3D, the plumes grow outward sort of cylindrically, you can imagine, okay? Okay. And what insects do is they go back and forth like this until they, they feel it. And then when they, they know the direction of the wind because they have wind sensors, and then they just go upwind until they fall out of the plume, and then they do this again and go upwind. So we actually haven't done much on flying animals. Kathy Nagel works on flies, but she actually, to make life a lot easier, she works on walking flies. <laughs> so, and, and so our flies are just walking on a 2D surface. Um, but for example, the, the two sensor thing won't work with with in 3D because you'll need three sensors to you know think of it as um, triangulation. <laughs> right. Actually, I, I don't know. Maybe it would. I I think you'd have to kind of rotate things um, because of the rotational symmetry. You'd have to be careful in how you set your sim sensors. Okay. Thank you. No other questions. Well, I'm kind of curious what, is, what you said about humans. You mentioned humans once in the talk about being able to do a little bit olfactory. Uh, Actually, I, I, I wish my, um, I, I wish I had the slides from my, oh, I, I wonder if, I don't think I have the slides from my PhD student's overview, which she gave on Tuesday. She has some great pictures of humans using binaural navigation to follow a trail, okay? So in fact that they do, what, what they did with humans is they put this thing on humans that kind of extended their nostrils out by a few inches. So they put like tubes on. Um, so they put, extended tubes on the human and then they put the human on a trail outside and they're able to follow this trail blindfolded quite well. So that means we can distinguish which of our two nostrils receives the the odor. Yes, when, when you have nostril extenders they can. <laughs> it's not clear whether they can with, with regular nostrils but um, they can with nostril extenders <laughs> and, and moles, okay? Moles actually use, are very good at using just, and, and, and you know how small a mole's nose is, right? And they found that when mole, when you block one, one of the nostrils of a mole, it does pretty badly at locating an odor. Whereas if you leave both of them open, it does much better. And Nathan Urban found that when you block one of the nostrils of a mouse, that it can find the mouse, it can find the trail, but it systematically um, is on one side or the other of the trail. It doesn't exactly stay in the center like it does. So what we think with mice is when it gets close, it uses both of them. How then, about? Huh? How Go ahead. How about group behavior like ants, where you uh, you would couple model uh, different individuals and try to maximize the uh, 
the success of the group instead of a single indiv individual. Oh. Do you have any thought on that? This is a great question, and I was really excited that we were going to do this because one of the people involved, okay, this, we, we got one of these things called a NeuroNext grant. It's a big grant, and it involves international people. And one of the people that was involved was a woman in Germany, I not cousin, who studies locusts, okay? And so I was really excited that we were going to th start thinking about social cues, but the German side decided not to fund her. So she's not involved. But I've still thought about this. I haven't done anything yet. But this is a really great question. If you have a whole bunch of, um, of these sensors out there and they communicate, what's the best way, you know, uh, you know how do you distinguish fake news from real news? Um, with, you know, <laughs> So how would you do this? Would you say, over here, this is good. The smell is better here. And, and we haven't done that, but it's really something I want to do. Um, I'm, I'm going to find a student to do this, an undergrad probably, because it's not included now in the purview of the grant. And so I can't let grad students do it because I have to pay them. But undergrads, you can get them to do, they like to do anything. Um, but no, it's a really good question. It is something that um, that I was really looking forward to to working on. But when when they pulled the rug out from under I not, um, I could still work on it, but I can't work on it and pay somebody. There is this woman in France who did also a lot of work. She's a CNRS researcher who did a lot of work with ants. Uh, oh, who like was how it? they actually uh, build preferential paths by like indicating to other ants how to actually get. Do you it. remember her name or can you write her name in the chat? Oh, I listened to a podcast. I can try to find it out. She did some work on blobs too. But that's in another which? story. In blobs. She did some work. I'm going to try to find out her, her, her name and then send to you by mail. You can either send it by chat or email me. I'm... <laughs> Barred it. You can, you. German trout's real easy to find. Okay, I will uh, find and probably mail because it's uh, gonna take a bit of time. Just what you shouldn't do, and here's here's a fun Google search. Type Bard space Pitt P I T T, um, and you'll get. Do you mean Brad Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll send you the information. So Ermin trout works better. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, oh. I have one question. Hi, um, I'm uh, Kenny. I'm, I'm working on a kind of a very closely to here. I don't know if you can hear me well, but we're in math and uh, neuroscience in particular. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, oh, first of all, the noise that you use is just regular normally distributed noise. Is that correct? Do I when use you, what? Uh, noise, when you added noise to your Oh, okay. In, okay, we for for the in order to do the analysis, I made the noise white because it was it reduced it to a the, the first passage time was um, very simple. But what we normally use is OU noise, and um, Nor, my PhD student, is also looking at the case um, with using levy flights as a search strategy. Um, We've done a whole lot of different search strategies. Some of them were kind of um, based on what humans do. It turns out one of the best search strategies is to just spiral outward. <laughs> that works really well. <laughs> and and you almost, you're guaranteed pretty much to always find it, but it's very wasteful because, you know, it's a lot of movement. Um, um, there's other algorithms that are much more complicated based on, um, the information content of, if I, there, there, there's, and this is a, I have an undergrad working on this, this idea that suppose that I sample and I don't sense anything, then that seems to be, let's avoid that area. <laughs> and so it's, you sort of add a kind of anti-gradient to that, um, that, no, that, that decreases, but that, that's really not so much noise. The noise here, for, for, for example, when we do the 
the random casting models, okay, that I think we've usually taken um, normally distributed, um, centered around the mean, because that's what the data of the mice indicates. Okay. Uh, and my second question was, uh, at the beginning, I think it was one of the first diagrams, there was two trails, one red and one uh, green. And I was wondering, there's no, there's nothing at the end of the trail. It's just the trail. Uh, it's just, the mice, oh, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Uh, sorry. Thanks. Which, which, this was, um, Here? Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the green trail is oil of wintergreen and the red trail is some other odor on which the mouse wasn't trained. Okay, okay, perfect, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Bard. Sure. Andre here. Um, yeah, I, well, so I have. The, I've turned off the share. <laughs> so they, they 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 are trained. So that means that they go over the same trail over and over again. How do you uh, distinguish, or would you be able to distinguish either experimentally or with the help of the model between following, you know, the the, the plumes the way you describe versus memorizing where things are. Ah, now that's a good question. And so what we are doing now experimentally <laughs> is, is that Nathan's done this, okay? You can use optogenetics, okay? So they, 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 they one of the, one of the, um, one of his students has started doing this, but Nathan just left for um, Lehigh. So I don't know when we're gonna be able to start it again, but, They've, they've come up with the following thing, okay? You pretend an odor is at some location in space, okay? And you have a kind of model for what the plume would look like. And in this case, we're using simply a Gaussian blob, okay? And now what happens is the mouse is trained, uh, the mouse is trained first on you know, to associate the optic genetic stimulation as it gets bigger to know that he's getting close. He wants to move, he's, he's taught to go up the gradient of optogenetic stimulation. And the, the optogenetic stimulation occurs in his olfactory bulb, okay? So basically, once he gets close, then the light goes on and he goes back and he gets food, all right? And then because it's a virtual thing, we can change the location. Mm -hmm. And what we do is each mouse um, gets put in there only one. Uh, he gets trained on an odor, but the odor is in arbitrary spots, right, when he's trained. Okay? So the mouse gets trained to associate the odor. And then when it's time to do the experiment, he gets put in there and the odors at some location he's never looked at before, or he doesn't, he, he doesn't memorize the location. The trails is different because you, you could argue that they memorize the trail, but unless they get positive feedback on that, and, and there, are, there are some experiments that were really bad where it was very clear that the animal was memorizing the trail. In, this, in, in these experiments, we didn't do these experiments. Somebody else did these experiments. The mouse was put in a very small box and there were three locations, okay, where the odor could be, all right? And it was very clear that after a couple of trials, the mouse's strategy was just to go visit Location one, location two, location three, and then return. Okay. Just path this integration. Is a, yeah. What? It's just doing path integration. Yeah. This is a big arena. It's much bigger arena, and the spot can be in a lot more spaces. And there's no light, so the mouse can't see anything. So he has no like hippocampal. Um, he has no external clues about where he is, and. 
basically, basically, the, one, of the, one of the students that did the experiments used to put the mouse in a cup and kind of shake it and then toss the mouse on so that it was very disoriented at first. And so it didn't know which way it was facing. Okay, so, thanks. Yep. Uh, hi, I have a question. Sure. Uh, um, so just regarding the stochastic pathing, uh, you said uh, noise can help with getting into like the basin of attraction and that larger noise, the farther away is preferred, whereas smaller noise, uh, the closer you are to yeah. the odor, preferably. Uh, so I'm just wondering, is it worth considering uh, noise whose variance is state dependent? Uh, so like the variance, for instance, is uh, it scales the closer you are to the odor? Location. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's some of the some of the. Um, well, we want to put noise in not as a strategy, but just to imitate more um, what the real odor landscape looks like. We oh, okay. will put we make the noise multiplicative with respect to the concentration because um, we've measured um, what's the what's the thing called PID. That's right. <laughs> PID, um, a photo ionization detector. Okay. Um, they use this and, and it detects organic, organic compounds. And basically, we put a drop of pure methyl salicylate in the middle, and then you can measure what, what the odor concentration looks like. And of course, it's much noisier as you get much more frequent and much noisier as you get closer to the odor. Oh, okay. So we have done, we, in order to test the algorithm, how robust it is, we've done that as well. We've done um, noise, not as a strategy, but as, um, as, a, um, as a test of robustness. Okay, Good. thank you. Well, do we have more questions? If that's not the case, let me thank you again. I'm going to uh, turn off the recording here and I'm going to uh, send people email where this recording will be visible.